I don't know how much you know about the Cafe Chino. Briefly, it was the first of the off-off-Broadway theaters. Uh, about three years after the Chino opened, there were 600 off-off-Broadway theaters in New York. It was terribly influential, both in subject matter and form and style, in all of the playwriting, movies, rock, concerts, so many things that have come since. I'm going to tell you how that all happened. Uh, I have to tell you a little bit about me first and how I got there. I'm from Roswell, New Mexico. I was a bookworm. There was no use whatsoever and no respect whatsoever for intelligence or education where I came from. The, almost every family photo of me shows me babysitting my sister's children. Some of you came in of a certain age may, may remember when there was no use for you in the family because you were not married and did not have children. <laughs> I grew up to be a Southwest art fairy. <laughs> there was nowhere for me to go, so I went into the service. I was thrown out because they found a love coin to another airman in my wallet, although I said, Stay. You can tell anybody you want I'm gay. I'll stay. They said they just couldn't. So like so many art fairies, I went into summer stock. But that's only three months. On my way back from summer stock in May, I stopped off in Manhattan to see a college friend who now lived there. He wasn't home, so I checked my bags with his landlady and asked her where Greenwich Village was, where the artists are. I took a subway train and got out on 14th Street and 7th Avenue. I walked down the street following the Salvation Army Band. And at Sheridan Square, I noticed this villagey little side street, just like in the movies. West 4th Street, cut it off. I walked down it, and at the corner of a one block long side street, I saw a boy with long hair and jewelry around his neck and thin linen pants, obviously wearing no underwear. I followed him down that one block long side street. Yeah. His name was Johnny Dodd. I had no way of knowing that he was a stage lighting genius whose work, the influence of whose work can still be seen in every crazily lit rock special on PBS. Uh, the place he went into was a funny little storefront with strange signs on it that you had to tilt your head to read. You can look after it. Okay. Sorry, these are the biggest pictures I have. There it is at night. The interior that afternoon was dark, sweet-smelling, smelling of coffee and Italian drink syrups. The ceilings were hung with little teeny tinsel toys and bells and little tiny Christmas tree lights, what they call ice cream lights. And the people that were there, I didn't know they were rehearsing. I thought they were putting on a show. How did I know people didn't put on shows in the afternoon in New York coffee houses? Were oddly dressed, strangely fresh and frank. I soon met the founder of the Cafe Chino, for that is what it was, Joe Chino. Joe was <clears throat> from a family in Buffalo. They had no use for art fairies in Buffalo either. So Joe, after a childhood and teens, came to New York to be an, an actor and dancer. He was a houseboy on Fire Island where they called him Ginger. Here he is on Fire Island. He acted in a few plays and then danced in some obscure troops around the country for a while. 
but he had a terrible weight problem for an answer. It was very short and had a weight problem. So he sort of retired very sadly at about 30 and opened a coffee house with the idea that just a place where his friends could come and his life was pretty much over. His lover, Johnny Torrey, was an electrical genius who rigged the wiring of the Chino so that the phone, the pay phone was free and he tapped the subway lines for electricity for Johnny Dodd's magnificent lights. Johnny stole the lighting instruments from various dance companies he did lights for. You never saw such lights in such a small little place. Joe lived behind the coffee counter where he received his friends, a hundred art fairies from all over. Important ones were an actor named Joe Davies, who was sort of the father figure to us and even to Joe. I don't suppose he was really that much older than us. Some of the important art fairies were Johnny Dodd, the light genius, Tommy Garland, who made sandwiches and danced in avant-garde dance a few blocks away at Judson Church, and Kenny Burgess, the dishwasher, who, who was an artist, and since the shows at the Chino were completely illegal, always, Kenny designed Art Nouveauish posters, which the cops would look at in the window and think were abstract art, but which the cognoscenti could tilt their heads and read what was on that week. <laughs> also, very important in a sort of spiritual way was, I suppose, a great fag hag <laughs> named Hope Stansbury. Hope was like a gay man who had been transplanted into perhaps the most beautiful face and body I've ever seen on a woman. She was a great woman. Her frankness and verve gave everybody permission to be free. You know, the way that so many beautiful female divas in the arts do for, for gay men. She was our resident diva. She also waited tables and acted and wrote. Right off, the Chino did play readings. That's the first one from December 58 when the place opened. It's from a Dorothy Parker short story called Here We Are. And they did poetry readings. This was a very popular reading of French surrealist poetry. And then a dancer who was the lover of one of Joe's friends, Charles Libier, named Billy Mitchell, convinced Joe that they should just go ahead and stage the play. That's why I just have readings. So this is Billy in one of the first stage plays, Edna Millay's Aria de Capo. Billy also staged two pirated productions of the musical The Boyfriend. You know, what could be here? <laughs> At the start, they did mostly existing plays. They pirated them. They, you know, uh, they never paid royalties. Uh, the most popular player I was Tennessee Williams. Here you see his Camino Real in 1961. That's the first dated performance photo from the Chief. There were many great people there. You'll have to take my word for it. This is another photo of the Middle That's Shirley Stoller, whom you saw in The Honeymoon Killers and Seven Beauties and various movies. And here happens to be Billy Mitchell, who started it all. Uh, another very great Tennessee Williams hit was Hello from Bertha with one of the great Chino actresses, Mary Boylan. Mary, by a genetic freak, looked 40 years older than she was. So she made a living for many years playing old women. You saw her in Night of the Iguana and Reflections of the Golden Eye. She played all the rooms about once, you recognize her. The play program was really stabilized when a director named Bob Dada, who, whose ears you see being pulled here, came in with his strolling players. They had been doing plays like, if you had a party, they would do a one-act play for you for a little money. He became, he stayed from 1960 through 1966, and is the Chino's most frequent, one of the few straight people important at the Chino. Here are some plays he did, including a very popular No Exit that was revived endlessly. Uh, even Joe, now everybody did everything at 
the cheap. You understand? This was not a theater. It was almost like a clubhouse where they said, hey, let's put on a show. There were very fine artists there, but there was no idea ever that it would get reviewed or anyone would get a career out of it or shows would move anywhere. You know, it was just, it was a totally new thing in the world. It's this private theater. There's Joe himself in a play. Directors began to accumulate, you know, and became very powerful and important. Here is Bob Dada. Here's Marshall Mason, who later won many Tonys for directing Lanford Wilson's plays on Broadway. Here's Andy Milligan, a sleazy underground movie maker who was also a great stage director. There's a book about Andy called The Ghastly One. He, he, made, he was a gentle, artistic man who made these gory, dirty exploitation movies, giving a lot of Chino people work in them, by the way. And this has a lot of the more sordid details about Chino sex life in it. Manager. Uh, they did plays like, here's Keith Carsey, one of the great Chino stars, in a pirated TV play, a play pirated from TV about juvenile delinquents. They did arty plays like Ionesco. Almost all heterosexual. And you know why? There were no gay plays. That's why, Chilla. Uh, some of the other important gay playwrights, uh, LA's own Bob Colby, did a beautiful play about younger and older actors long before David Manor lived a life in the theater. Uh, a beautiful girl named Laurie Lane did probably the first women's live play, The War Between Men and Women. Good old macho Sam Shepard did Icarus's mother. You all know Sam, he's a movie star now. And John Ware, who wrote Six Degrees of Separation and Two Gentlemen of Verona, did his two very first plays at the Cafe Chino. As I say, it was, you know, there were only heterosexual plays to be done, so people did only heterosexual plays. There's some foggy early gay elements. Here is a photo, a foggy photo of apparently drag queens, identifiably in the Chino, but no one knows what the show is or who the people are. Naturally, there aren't many records of this early stuff. Matt Baylor, big old handsome bruiser Matt Baylor, did a show called The Civil War in which he wore an evening gown and roller skates and tore phone books in half. <laughs> last, Matt died last year, still promising to give me the photos of it. So there was this, you know, subterranean gay element. Hope Stansberry and uh, her fellow waiter, Hal Borsky, did a play of which again we have this foggy photo where she played the man in top hat and that's Hal in female Victorian dress. But nobody remembers what the play was. Andy Milligan, whom I mentioned before, did homoerotic versions of Genet's Death Watch and the Maids. Uh, in the Maids, he had the two maids take a break for a lesbian love scene. And I wish I had this a better copy of this photo. This is one of the handsomest men who ever lived, Dean Selmire, in Andy's incredibly skimpy French prison garb. It was, the, the show was so steamy that the actors literally sweated even though they were half naked. Tiny Tim performed there. Here he is seen the actors Mary Claire Charba off in 1964 to take the first off-off Broadway play to Europe. And there were people like self-styled Southern lady Jim Perkinson, who did gayish plays like his own reflect, uh, Recollections of Cabbage Roses, a very Tennessee Weep sort of play, and Wiles Salome, 